Good evening, friends, family. Welcome back to Coffee with Toffees. My name is Toffees, as always, here uh, to just bring you interviews, chats, talkbacks, really whatever kicks my fancy for the week. And uh, the man who's caught my fancy is someone who's been hard to get a hold of because he's been so busy jet-setting around. I heard rumors that this guy is going to be going somewhere else in a week or two or maybe a couple of days. I, so, so lots going on. I finally got him to sit down with me. Uh, that's our guest for today. Now, before I introduce him to you, I'm going to put him on screen so you can look at his beautiful face, but I do want to give a big shout out to those who've made this possible, um, Asus and Razer, who've given us most of the equipment to do the show, and of course, Unicorn, a uh, site that has stepped up and said, hey, Toffees, we want you to be able to sort of make what you want to make and do these interviews, and we're going to back you on doing that. So um, we've talked to them. They are safe, regulated, and legal betting. If you are under 21 or in North America, don't even bother trying to put money on the line. Um, but it does have a free betting. So what I got into Lyrical is I used to bet a lot when I started oh, yeah. playing. Or when I started Dota, I loved betting skins. Mm -hmm. Then I started being a personality, and I stopped betting because it felt like mm, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, you know? Yeah, uh, sure. But I found Unicorn, they have a free play money. So basically I can still oh. make it more fun to watch some of the matches for myself without actually... Feel like I'm trying to cheat or steal or do any of that kind of crazy stuff. So um, that's something that I thought was really cool and I like to share with people because I know a lot of people who also enjoy, I don't know, having a little more skin on the line when they're watching a game. So uh, thank you to them for coming on board and helping us get this up and running. Now a big thank you, of course, goes to our guest today who is here. His name is Gabriel Cruz. He goes by Lyrical Dota. He used to be the Lyrical Gangster, but he's gotten married and settled down and now he's a lot more calm, so that's why we sort of changed the name, I'm assuming. Uh, that's it. How are you doing tonight, Gabriel? I'm doing great. I just got done playing a lot of Dota. I've been playing about 12 games a day, which is wow. insane. That's a lot. And then uh, it is. And then I switched back down. Today I only did seven games. Um, They're just too painful to, to <laughs> stick with it. But it's been good. That, watching the summit, a lot of stuff. Mm. Uh, it's been nice. So let me ask you this. this is, I wasn't even planning on asking this, but you just said you played 12 games a day. <laughs> I play. I try to play a lot of Dota, but after like three to four games, I start to get hit very hard with like a burnout, a frustration factor, a need to sort of just reset my brain. How do you do twelve games a day? Um. Well, I think one of the things is uh, is sort of taking everything a little bit light. Mm -hmm. I, I this I sort of I, we've talked about this before, but I came from the StarCraft background, and one of the biggest things that people were sort of embedded with in that scene was every individual game doesn't matter what matters more is learning what you can from each and every game and so that's the mindset that i go when i try and play and stream or whatever is i i say okay we're just going to do whatever we can in this instance to win we're going to try and outplay them on this one particular moment um and that way it takes a little bit it provides a little bit more levity to the situation uh and then of course the the spamming of the chat wheel is also necessary so they're all dead and wow when you miss a last hit or whatever it's great Nice. Yeah, no, the voice chat, I, you know, I was skeptical when they announced it, the uh, the voice lines, but it seems like it's going over very well, very popular among the community. So very, very cool. All right, so let's talk about you, Gabe, uh, Gabe or Gabriel. Which one do you prefer? Either or. Yeah, okay. Gabe is fine. I, that's why people tend to call me. It's a little, it's a little easier. It rolls off my yeah. tongue a little simpler. So, Gabe, uh, let's talk about where you've come from and where you're going to so like star ladder season three that was i believe that was your first land final super cool um so before we get into where you came from real quick what lands do you currently have under your belt right now uh there was the star ladder one um the star ladder star series season three uh that was my first and then dac came immediately after that awesome. i was I don't remember if I, I might have even like been in the air or something when I got a Skype message, people asking me if I wanted to do it, um, which blew my mind. And That's then awesome. uh, the last one was the most uh, the most recent Starlighter Invitational as well. Oh. And then besides that, the BTS hubs, which are a little bit different, but it's still sort of that LAM atmosphere. atmosphere. It's still a LAM. You're still flying out. You're part yeah. of the process. You're a big community face at that point. Um, and now that's a big transition. So to have one LAN as a personality or a caster or a play-by-player -play or whatever is an accomplishment. To have three formal lands and a couple of summits and this other kind of stuff going on, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big achievement. So congratulations. Now, Thank you. 4 years ago, you were a chef at a restaurant if my memory serves me correctly that you didn't I don't know if you didn't like the restaurant or you just hated food or you hated chefing in general, but I I got the feeling you were generally disgruntled with your position. 
Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I, I've talked about this before, and there was just a lot of. Um, it, it's a hard environment to work in, just in, in general, working on your feet for 12 hours a day. I mean, you know, playing 12 games of Dota is tough on your mind, but <laughs> staying yeah. on your feet for all that time, bending over and lifting heavy objects and cutting things up for 12 right. hours on a double, it sucks. And then on top of that, uh, a lot of the people that work in the restaurant industry are like a little bit insane. <laughs> um, and Oh, and esports and, is better? Esports is way better. I, <laughs> okay. I can't even tell you. Oh, my God. Um, if you've ever read Anthony Bourdain's book, that's it's a pretty good insight to it. Kitchen Confidential. Uh, that's sort of what it looks like where you just – I don't know. Anyways, people are crazy, and I wasn't happy with it. And that's why I started playing Dota as like an outlet and saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this game and really develop my mind and say we're going to have fun here. Uh, and then it just you know all sort of snowballed from there. Gotcha. And I think a lot of people have had that feeling. Dota's a great outlet. It's uh, For me, I started playing because I blew my knee out uh, and I couldn't play competitive sports anymore. So Dota sort of filled that void. Now, a lot of us find our way to Dota for whatever reason. And then I think a lot of people go, well, maybe I could get involved with the scene. Um, and then a lot of them don't end up doing it or doesn't work out. You did it very differently. You actually managed to somehow, in about three years, um, in a time period where I think a lot of us can agree or, or, or we've all heard it said, it's a very hard time to break into Dota 2 esports uh, with the establishment of the studios and talent not getting as up and coming options as they used to, smaller tournaments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What was your path? Sort of how did you get to where you are? And what, and maybe even first, what made you just want to do it? Um, well, I think. W- the, the answers are kind of the same where it's okay. what it was that made me want to do it. It, it wasn't really, uh, it, I don't know if it, the, at least at the beginning there was that goal in mind um, to try and do that. It was more that, and I'll, you know, I'm just, I'm rambling. So I'll just go through this start to finish. Um, I started playing Dota. I got into it. I loved the game. I would, you know, watch a bunch of videos, mm-hmm. learn how to do these different things. And then I started to become like more and more angry at the game uh, I was like spamming Storm Spirit in the mid lane and being like, ah, oh, God, I, you know, I, I hate my teammates or whatever. They're going crazy. And then it ended up uh, starting to be a situation where I wasn't having as much fun playing the game anymore. Mm. So I joined an in house league and then I started having a ton of fun. My first like two or three games in the in house league, I was just like, all right, whatever, I'll play Techies. It'll be fun. And I, I played Techies. And then I realized that somebody was casting my game. Mm. Um, and it was a guy who's on my friends list, so I still play with him every now. His name's Nothing Matters, uh-huh. uh, which is a great name to have. <laughs> but he uh, he was casting my game, and I went back into the replay afterwards because if you load in the replay, you can obviously hear the casters. And then I heard what he was saying, and I heard him talking uh, with like a co-caster about me and playing techies and you know other things that were happening throughout the map. And I was like, that sounds like fun. I want to do that for the in-house league too. Uh-huh. So I started casting the games for the in-house league. Uh, and I started to grow a little bit of a following. It was diehard Dota, and I have a bunch of these people still on my friends list. I don't play with them as often anymore because like, it, I'm on weird hours, um, but every now and then I'll still pop in and play with them. Uh, and they eventually told me that, you know, you need to uh, try to take this more seriously. You should start trying to, you know, go for things, and that's kind of how it developed from there. Very cool. Now... Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the show, something that a lot of people might not know about you, or they probably do, if it, I doubt you don't really hide it on Twitter or anything, is you're married. You've been married for how long now? Uh, a year and a half. Okay. About then. So you were dating at the time that you started your casting pursuits. Uh, that, to me, maybe it seems like, a, how did that conversation go? When does one turn to their fiancé and say, mm, the chefing thing... Good money, but I'm kind of tired of cash. Let me see if I can work in one of the hardest industries in the world. Yeah, that was an interesting conversation. It didn't go like that. <laughs> I think we'd be in a different place if I had that conversation. Um, I, I, I mean, she could tell that I hated my job. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a situation where, uh, like, we graduated. We've, we've been together for now nine and a half years. Um, so we've been together a really long time. I, sort of waited to get married uh but we started dating and when i eventually uh got around to our senior years we were like we want to go travel the world so 
we decided to save up our money for about a year. She's a year older than I am. So she stayed in the city that we were in and got a job uh, at a daycare center or something okay. because we wanted something where it was like we don't feel bad leaving that job. If you start a, a big career, mm -hmm. suddenly you're going to be worried about leaving that career. So we wanted to make sure that when we got to the point where I graduated, we could head off and start doing our stuff. Uh, but we still didn't have enough money when I graduated. So I ended up taking that job in the restaurant. She was working in the child care facility. And then it was like, she didn't like that one either. And so mm -hmm. we were like, all right, let's get out of this. We're going to just go. Mm -hmm. uh, so we ended up jet setting off. We had saved up our money for about a year, not really doing like any trips or anything. And we spent about three, uh, three months or so um, just backpacking through Europe. Oh, wow. Um, it, until we were broke. We were broke as a joke. We had like a thousand dollars in our bank account when we got back and we had to use that to get like to my family's house. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had no money when we came back and we had to uh, end up taking whatever job would give us. And it was like right in the middle of the recession. Uh, and so the restaurant hired me back on and that was gave us sort of enough time where she could find a job that she really liked and didn't have to go back to that other crappy job. So when it came to this time, uh, she had further progressed in hers to the point where she was making enough money to support us. And I said, you know, this is something that I want to give a shot. Um, mm -hmm. I had gotten t contacted by Hefla TV at that point to say, like, you know, do you want to do some events? Um, and she said, give it a shot. Go for a year and we'll see what ends up happening. And um, a year went around. I didn't get invited to TI, but I did start to get invited to the BTS events. And mm -hmm. I think if I hadn't gotten invited to those, I'd probably be back to doing something else at this point. Fair. So you did have something that I think a lot of young casters or wannabe casters don't have, which is a pretty good support system outside of the game, which I think if you talk to a lot of casters uh, in the recent years, a lot of them have that sort of thing. And it's cool to see. I'm glad to hear that she's supportive. For those of you, uh, I know that you hear Gabe say that she's awesome. I actually got to meet her, I think it was a year ago, two years yeah. ago. Um, and I can verify that she is awesome. I don't think she fully understands everything about Dota, but definitely gets into it. And I think I had a lot of fun at TI. It looked like she was having a blast on the on the grass watching the game. So, yeah. uh, I mean, my wife won't even come to TI, so kudos to you for finding somebody <laughs> well, who's willing to sit there and watch Dota. I mean, to be fair, though, like, it's a lot longer of a distance for you two. We live in Portland. That's fair. That's like, fair. Right up the way. Yeah. <laughs> fair. Okay, so not only is his wife cool and he's nice, but he also gives excuses for my wife's lack of love for Dota. <laughs> so, muchas apreciado, my friend. Uh, very nice. Okay. Um, so, you've got the whole marriage thing. You've sort of made it work. And now you have gone from casting amateur leagues to doing sort of some off Hefla contracts, which um, for those of you who don't know, I don't really do a lot of contracts anymore, so I can talk about it without worry about much, but it's not like it pays very well. It's a pretty tough uh, gig, lots of hours, lots of grinding, not tons of money coming into your PayPal account until you get to sort of the big lands in the studio gigs. And you've gotten that. You've gotten to this point where you're now getting lands. Is it surreal for you to sort of look back at the last three years um, what's it like now that you're sort of getting, I don't know, getting a Skype message on a plane from somebody offering you a contract to come cast a tournament? Like that to me sounds pretty freaking cool. Yeah. It, uh, it constantly blows my mind. I really, I, I just feel incredibly lucky, um, and very thankful for everything. And I think that it, uh, it definitely feels surreal. Hmm. The, the biggest thing for me was going to DAC and looking like out on the stadium because the stadium is huge right and we're right in the middle of it and there's so many people that are watching and it's like I'm still doing the same thing that I do right here in this room with the little mirror behind me and stuff mm -hmm. but I am doing it on a stage in front of thousands and thousands of people uh, and once I get into the game it's sort of like all of that pressure and tension goes away but especially like my very first LAN when I was at Starlight Star Series uh, you know, I was I was casting with Merlini, and um, he could tell that I was just shaken and shook. <laughs> and he sort of like, you know, he he kept on doing this thing where he would like, you know, put a hand on me or something, and it sort of like was a connection with another person that um, sort of I felt like I needed at that point. And for them, you know, this doesn't matter at all. It was like a a five thousand seat arena or something where nobody ends up really caring, but. Uh, because they've done so many of them before. They've cast on TA main stage with right. their voice in their ears and stuff. But for me, I was just completely shaken. I remember that I went backstage afterwards and Fogg was like, you looked really afraid. And I was like, yeah, I was. <laughs> he was like, you couldn't tell with your voice afterwards, but you looked very scared. Um, but since then, it's gotten easier. Each one's been a little bit easier. Yeah. 
fogged with all the supportive the supportive commentary. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this: This is something that I think is surreal, and I wonder if you if you ever adjust to it. When you go to these big events and someone stops you to sign an autograph, does that feel like pro like business as usual at this point, or is that still sort of catch you off guard when it happens? When it happens, I'll let you know. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Nobody's asked me to sign autograph. I've only gone to lands in China. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Fair point. Okay, okay. So yeah. we'll get you to TI here in the next year or two, and at that point, you get to sign that autograph book and and uh, tell us what it feels like. Everybody who comes on here says it's the strangest thing because in my real life, no one knows me. Uh, but when you go to TI, it sort of changes. They just they, they can, they'll hear you talking around a corner and maybe come running. Uh, very very interesting. So now that you've sort of been through this, you went through these hard years. There's something that I think was very interesting. When I started casting a long time ago and doing shows and stuff, and I was doing it all the time, sort of that grind that you that you went through, Zayori told me, you're going to get burned out, man. Everyone gets burned out. Everybody has a hard time about a year into this thing, and it gets really, really difficult. I, did you hit that point where during this grind you started to feel a sense of burnout, or you had moments where you just thought, maybe, maybe I should go do something else? And if you did, how did you get through those and keep grinding forward? Um, I had one moment that I remember very specifically uh, at the BTS house. And it's not like the big house that's up on the mansion. It's the old one where the original summits were at. And I had been casting the open qualifiers solo for like 12 hours a day. Um, mm -hmm. It was the open qualifiers for maybe Manila, I want to say. And then I had also been casting the qualifiers for another set of tournaments the whole two weeks preceding that probably another 10 to 12 hours a day mm. and then it was like solo casting for 12 hours and then i would end up going back to the house and i would sleep for like you know six hours and then i would get up and then i would go cast again for 12 hours and it was just like over and over and over and over and over again there was so much casting and i remember just feeling sad that was the mm. biggest thing it burnout's like kind of weird because for me at least when i get it i feel like sort of depressed and i get inward and reclusive um, and I, I can still work through it, but I don't put out the best performance anymore. But that's the only mm -hmm. time that I really remember it. And the way that I got through it was I went and I played some Dota. <laughs> and wow. I, I ended up getting happy because I stomped somebody as Storm Spirit. And then I was like, all right, this is cool. That's uh, impressive. But uh, I, besides that, I, I don't know. I have a lot of energy and I have a lot of stuff. Maybe I just haven't hit that burnout point. Um, hmm. But I've been casting for long enough now that I feel like if I would have, I, I kind of might have. Uh, the other thing is that um, just in general, I've dealt with a lot of – I dealt with burnout at my last job when I was mm -hmm. working as a chef. Uh, and so I sort of know the signs leading up to it. So I tend to take care of myself either like through playing guitar in between matches or something like that. That's cool. That's cool. And, and that sort of brings us to something else that gets talked about a lot when people talk about Lyrical. Um, in fact, I think there was a thread on Reddit. It was about a year. It was right around the time you did Star Ladder. And somebody's had a Reddit that was like, who's this Lyrical guy and where did he come from? And I thought that was funny. But then what I thought was amazing is the response somebody put under that is, I don't know, but he's the happiest person I've ever seen. And then there was just a whole thread of people talking about, I know, he never stops smiling. He's like a teddy bear. I want a hug. And it was just sort of like this big reflection on people's appreciation of your public PMA, I guess, is maybe a good way to describe it. You always seem to sort of exude things. Even if even if the production is burning down around me, everything is fine. I'm just here to bring a good show. Is that something that you naturally have, or is that something that you sort of like prep and go into these things and say, "All right, no matter what happens, I'm bringing I'm bringing a certain attitude to this." Um, I would say that it's more along the lines of the I'm I'm, I'm trying to bring a good attitude mm -hmm. to it, and I do by and large have a more positive outlook on life and more optimistic. That's what everybody who knows me sort of uh, characterizes me as. Uh, and I don't know exactly where it came from necessarily. It, probably growing up at some point. Um, I, also, my mom, when she was raising me, would often say things along the lines of like, you know, uh, what was the what was the word? Count your blessings. Mm. Uh, she was very religious. I'm not religious, but I still like the expression because I feel like it's something that uh, too often gets overlooked. Is how lucky we all are, each of us, in whatever it is that's going on in our lives. Like, there's so much to be thankful for that, you know, the little stuff doesn't really matter that much. And you just sort of take it in stride. 
uh, particularly me, if I'm going to a LAN event, mm -hmm. I don't care if my luggage got lost because I'm at the LAN event and I'm going right. to be able to cast and we're going to make it work. Um, that's just right. what it's going to be. Bring one suit with you on the plane, I guess, is the uh, or on the, exactly. in, the in the carry on, just in case. Uh, very cool. And, and honestly, I can tell you, as somebody, I've I've had the pleasure of watching your career sort of develop over the last couple of years. Um, I think we've done a few ATPs together, a few coffee with toffees. I'm always struck by your attitude when you come in, and just sort of how excited you are to do everything. And that's infectious and encouraging, and a lot of fun to sort of watch and support. Um, as, as honestly, I think you become a much larger name in the play-by-play -play game. Now, regarding that, are, do you see yourself as just a play-by-play -play guy, or do you think you would be just as comfortable in the analyst role sitting next to you on a, on a panel or on a cast? Um, for the cast, probably not as much, because mm -hmm. I don't have enough game knowledge for understanding the intricacies of what's going on and where we stand in a game. Mm -hmm. um, I've done it before, and I've done it a couple of times, and it can usually pass because you can talk about other things. You can talk about map movements and stuff mm -hmm. like that and maybe catch a few little things here and there. Uh, but what I do think is I could end up being pretty good on a panel. Mm -hmm. um, I study a lot. So I come usually with, I don't know if I have one near me right now. Um, let me see, one second. I've got these little things here, which are like books just full of notes about, uh, you know, what are the teams? What are they picking? What's their win rates? What uh, what lands have the teams played in recently? Um, all that stuff. And so I study a lot of the games and I study and I watch a lot of the games because I'm casting so much. So I have a lot of team specific knowledge that I could mm -hmm. bring to a panel. Um, which and is something probably where it could go. Well, and that's something we don't see enough on panels, in my opinion, is I think that we have right now really great hosts, really great color people, right? You know, sort of like when Slacks pops on or, or yeah. uh, period, and they sort of have a great time. And we've got these genius analysts, but what I really want is something like what you brought up, Gabe. I want to bring Gabriel on the panel, and I want him to talk about team mentality and function and say things like, well, this team has mentally been playing this way, or hell, tell me if they had a bad flight, and that might be making them reconsider their position in this game. Because that's the kind of, I don't know, real world stuff that I, that I feel like we want to hear um, and, and it looks like your book has a lot of that information. Now, regarding the book, <laughs> that was a lot of notes. That was like more notes than I took in college. Uh, <laughs> so here's the real question. When do you do that and how? If you're playing 12 hours of Dota, uh, is that like 12 more hours of replay and you don't sleep? Do you compile that from sites generally? Like where do you, how do you put together those databases? Uh, usually I take about a week before a LAN um, and just spend every day studying mm -hmm. a different team. So I, that's why right now I'm trying to figure out which region I'm going to be on for the TI uh, qualifiers because uh, I want to study up on those teams and figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Star Letter, uh, Star Series Season 3, I would you know build... I'd spend a day studying Liquid, a day studying BGJ, look at all of their past games throughout that day, and then uh, study the Dota buff replay, or Dota buff things. Look at like what they're banning and mm -hmm. what they're picking, and then also particularly if there's a, a player that's not well known, um, I would watch one or two games from their perspective to see what their map movement is like and what their sort of awareness is focused on. And the unfortunate part is that I don't always get an opportunity to talk about that on the panel. Right. Uh, I, I usually there's sometimes where I can sneak it into a cast. But it's like, you know, I'll study for maybe uh, an hour or something, this one player's perspective, and then there will be like a three-second soundbite in there that I can fill and say, when I watched through his player perspective, I noticed right. that he tended to look towards bottom first to see if he wanted to make that rotation instead of going top, or something like that. Like, it, I can fill in a little thing, and then they make that move, and it looks cool for a second, but it's kind of, you don't always get the highest returns relative to the work that you put into right. it, which is why I wouldn't mind going on a panel at some point. What percentage would you say you use of the studying that you do? It's like when you 5%. walk five percent. Okay, and you're a good company. So to be clear, guys, uh, Red Eye was on the show before Ti. I think it was last year, and, and I don't have the exact number. I'm going to go off the cuff here, but I asked him the same question. He's a panel host, and he said he uses twenty five to thirty percent of his research. The rest sort of is just on standby. So not uncommon. Uh, pretty cool that you're willing to put that much work in because, you know, we all watched, uh, what was the tournament that was a giant debacle? Oh, God, Shanghai, remember? And yeah. Coddle Guy ended up hosting that thing sort of out of nowhere. And it was one of those situations where you go, man, 
the preparation pays off in that instance. And I think that esports is all about opportunity and seizing the moment. So uh, it's glad to hear that you are ready should that happen, guys. So those of you who are watching, Gabe is ready for the panel. Give and that's the, panel. the thing. <laughs> well, I got to do some at the last one, which was cool. I got to do that a few times um, mm -hmm. at the Invitational. But it's also why, you know, at, the, at events I'll stick around afterwards, even if I'm off sometimes. I don't mm -hmm. always do it. But, like, if somebody gets sick or somebody can't yeah. go on for some reason, you stick around. You make yourself available. And, honestly, if anybody out there is trying to get into esports, that's how you get onto casts also. That's how you get onto online casts is say, I'm available and then – when crisis mode comes and a caster is looking for a backup co-caster, they just spam their, you know, Skype or Twitter or their Discord or whatever, and whoever ends up showing up first is usually who hops on. So if you're looking to get in, just be available. Yep, there is a old, uh, an old thing in acting in the theater and film world called schmoozing, and it is 100% alive and real in esports. And I encourage you guys, if you are aspiring. Schmooze your brains out. Find people, get to know them. Don't cyber stock because that's weird. But definitely, yeah, Let if you're interested, let us know. I mean, if you have a highlight reel or you do a lot of stuff, say, hey, I'd love for you to check out my stuff sometime. Um, get get involved. Hang out at the events. That's the best way to sort of make, make movement in the scene. All right, so that's your past, where you got to where you are now. Now let's talk about your expertise. I, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but how could I not? Because direct invites were announced a couple of hours ago. Um, or at least I saw them a few hours ago. Uh, so OG, Virtus Pro, Evil Geniuses, Team Liquid, Invictus, and Newbie. Are those the right six for you? Did somebody get to the shaft? Did somebody, did, does everybody deserve to be there? I think that it's the right uh, collection of invites given the criteria that you had before. Um, that you are going to invite people based upon lands, that you're going to invite people based upon their success at those lands, and particularly majors being a big, inf uh, like a big influence on it. Mm. The problem that I have is that I, I do think that right now Invictus Gaming is the fourth or fifth best team in China, um, even though they're on the direct invite. And I think it had mm. to be that way because they did so well at Kiev and because they have done consistently well at a lot of these other lands. But I think that they are still the fourth or fifth best team in China, okay. um, just because of how the, those events have played out inside that region. Um, whether or not they would be the best against international competition is kind of another story because like, you look at a team, for instance, like TNC, that for a mm -hmm. long time they uh, were able to do well against international competition, but they couldn't beat Faceless inside their right. own region. But I, I think that it's a little bit different where IG isn't performing as well as an LGD, a LFY, Avicii Gaming. Those teams feel like they're a little bit stronger right now than IG. Uh, that's the only one I have an exception with at all, but I understand why it's there and I kind of agree with it. So do you think that the invites, these six invites are regionally based or are they, or are they performance based? Because oh, you said that they're based. Okay. Excellent. And then my last question is, so we saw uh, the, so there were two tournaments going on last week. We had BTS, uh, and then we had our, I don't want to call it the Asian tournament, but sort of the other side of the world was doing galaxy battles at the same time. That final came down to Newbie versus Planet Odd. Now, Planet Odd, one of those teams that, like, I look at their roster and I go, man, these guys have insane potential. They got to the finals in that tournament. Uh, they got dropped pretty hard against Newbie. Do you think if they had won, they would have potentially gotten that spot? Did, or did, did Newbie lock this up with the win at Galaxy Battles? I find it hard to imagine Planet Odd being able to get the invite, but we don't really know what the you know Valve's right. criteria is behind it. Uh, for me, I think that the Planet Odd situation is tough because uh, they have four of their previous roster from when they won TI, and there's mm -hmm. like maybe a case to be made that because Wings isn't a thing anymore, mm -hmm. if you had all five of them, you could get them there. But I, I think that the case is a little bit slim based upon their results. Uh, I, I, based upon their land results, I don't think that you could fully give it to them, but maybe you could have. I, I don't know. It would all depend upon Valve waiting and uh, waiting of the events. But so then at he, the end of the day, here's newbie the, definitely clocked it up, though. So newbie clocked it out. Now here, I guess my question is, if maybe if 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 newbie hadn't beaten Planet Odd, do you think that spot would have gone to a different team? Do you think the newbie spot would have gone to a different yeah. team? Yeah. Did, did did was that tournament as much as it maybe had some tech issues and stuff, sort of a clincher for newbie, a must win, or do you think that they already had that locked up? I'm just curious. I think that they had it pretty fairly locked up. Okay. Um, they were doing well enough. I I, I mean, in my eyes, I I think that the only other team that 
probably could have had an invite would have been like TNC. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that that changes the dynamic of the team all that much, or the dynamic of the invites that much. You would probably still then have uh, an extra spot for China instead of an extra right. spot for Southeast Asia. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's that's good insight, and uh, we'll talk. I'm going to talk more. I'm going to find a time on a show to talk about sort of the qualif the regional qualifiers breakout, the Europe West, Europe East thing is kind of uh, interesting and new to me. The fact that South America only has four teams yet is separated from North America is interesting to me. Uh, but I don't know if we have enough time to get into sort of the ramifications of that. So uh, maybe if we put together a show, uh, I'd love to have you back, Gabe, to talk about sort of your opinions on the breakup of the regions. Uh, what Before I ask you what's next and we log out of this session, I am curious about this because it popped up again on the forums. Uh, a couple of forums this week. What? How would you rate the health of Dota 2 as an eSport right now? Do you think that we're thriving in a way that we never have before? Do you think that things are on a downturn, as some people have mentioned or tried to mention? Uh, Gods came out and said in a uh, the BTS thread, he doesn't agree that it's on a downturn. He thinks that Dota is doing great. Dota is very healthy. Um, other casters have said otherwise. So what are your thoughts on the health of Dota? Um, well, I would say first and foremost that I am not an expert in this. Uh, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, I don't want to try and pretend like I know more than I actually know. But what I will say is that I think you have the health of esports is very dependent upon where you sit with it. Mm -hmm. For tier two teams, for tier two, uh, you know, talent and organizations, it's tough. It's not easy. It's hard to be a person in that vein. Like, you think about everybody that's just below the cusp of, uh, you know, being a, a top whatever that is. Right. And and it, it sucks. That's just the reality of it. If you make it past that, like, threshold into the top tier either of talent or of players or of teams or of uh, organizations even, then things start to look a lot better for you. And honestly, I, I, I don't... Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing necessarily, mm -hmm. but it's it's sort of where we're at. On the one hand, it incentivizes you crazily to be the best, which means that you're going to have the best competition constantly. Uh, and for the people that just like casually playing Dota 2, I don't think that it's in a bad place either. Mm -hmm. um, it just sort of depends upon where you sit. And I, I think that there's probably things that we could be doing better. There's always something that we could be doing better, but I think we're in a pretty good spot by and large. Uh, it, it's just like, you know, Maybe the community being more aware of things is a good thing, uh, but I wouldn't sort of be holding a sign out saying the end is nigh or anything like that. Gotcha. So viewership drops have exist, but they don't seem tragic in terms of a huge drop off. And, and, and yeah. we do need to develop the tier two, I think is also another big, big question mark is as our, as our pros, our leaders start to retire and buy their own gaming corporations. Where do we get the next Peter Dagger? Where do we get the next uh, player well, up and coming? And the point that you made earlier also about South America only having four mm -hmm. teams, it's a sort of this situation now where, uh, or in North America also, they're kind of a, a struggle to find teams outside of those big however many. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have like this core set of pros that are the best in their region mm -hmm. and then the drop off from that is so significant because you don't even even have people that are forming teams to try and win a big pot of money right. that's why you know we have Aosin in the in the chat here he ended up putting together this really cool tournament uh that was from an amateur dota 2 tournament that had a pretty decent sized prize pool mm -hmm. um and when you have something like that that helps to develop the teams that helps to develop the the player base where you actually even if they're not the highest skilled, they're at least a team that's staying together so that you can eventually develop into that next tier of team where you can compete for the international. And then suddenly you have larger qualifiers and stuff like that. Absolutely. No, it definitely makes sense. I, I uh, There are many nights when I turn on stream the Twitch and I and I miss NA Dota and sort of their nightly events and tournaments and pickups and uh, yeah. daily cups and things like that. So maybe we'll see a return to that. I, I, can't, I can't say I... I I have to say, I hope that that happens. Uh, what's next for you, Gabriel? What's up on the docket? What are we watching for? Where do we find you? I've been streaming a lot recently. I told you I've been playing 12 games of Dota Jeez. a day. Yeah. <laughs> it's been wonderful, uh, by and large. Um, so twitch.tv slash Lyrical Dota for that one if you want to tune in. Uh, besides that, I'm going to be at the BTS uh, TI 
hub, Ooh. which I'm also very excited about. Very cool. That's going to be, it sounds like there's more content that's going to be going on than normal. So keep your eyes out for that. They're uh, bringing us in a day early to do a media day. So oh, wow. there's going to be some actual things. Uh, because that's the big problem that you've had with these events before is that right. it's 72 or however many hours of Dota in a row constantly. So you cast for 12 hours, you do your shift, you mm -hmm. go to bed, and then you wake back up and do your shift again. And there's no time for any of that extra cool content that everybody talks about from like the TI4 hub or whatever else. Because those were spread out over like multiple weeks. This one's yep. in three day set. It's just it's a lot of Dota. So I'm excited that there's going to be some filler content in there for people as well this time around. That'd be cool. It seems like BTS is really wrapping their heads around sort of finding the balance between casual and serious. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch them develop as a studio. And it's kind of cool that you get to see that firsthand uh, by being at these events. Well, uh, where? go ahead and take a second to plug yourself. Let us know how we can okay. support you, how we can get you onto more analyst panels, uh, things like that. Well, like I said, twitch.tv slash lyrical Dota. Um, besides that, Twitter, I'm at Lyrical Dota, and I have a YouTube, I think, as well. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> I, I barely ever post things onto that. Uh, YouTube.com slash Lyrical. Is that what it is? Lyrical Dota? Hashtag um, convincing, nope, four, convincing plugs with Lyrical. 404 not found. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Lyrical Gangster? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what yeah, it is. It's terrible. Terrible. That's hilarious. Um, but yeah, that one, and then you know, as far as getting me on panels, just you know, all those Reddit threads, it's beautiful. Yeah. I'll munch them up. <laughs> you know, that there's no better feeling than seeing a, your name at the top of a Reddit list, like some sort of shout out. It's up there on par with like having your name pop up on the front page for leaving a overlay on for five minutes or mm. something of that sort. I uh, I think we all feel, felt that pain that day. It's oh, funny, right? Because so those who don't know, uh, Lyrical had his first debut with BTS. I think it was your first time casting for them, right? Under contract. Yep. And he left the overlay up for the first five minutes of the game. Which, if you are a caster or have done any of this before, you have done this at some point. Because it's, you know, we're producing our own content, right? From our from wherever you're sitting. And so, like, for those of us who have done it before, we all sort of laughed and chuckled. But I know, like, for you, that had to have been incredibly uh, frustrating. Mortified. Exactly. So it's one of those things, like, we chuckle about it now, but at the time, you know, just, like, you're sitting there in your chair, and, like, the whole cast afterwards, you're just like, oh, my God, how do I bounce back from that? Uh, it's way worse than missing first blood. <laughs> but that said, though, I mean, I think that you have made leaps and bounds in the business. It's super cool to see you doing it full time. Um, it's great to see somebody who's so positive about the industry and sort of forthcoming with everybody. Uh, and honestly, it's very cool to see you do it with a teammate, uh, with a spouse who's incredibly supportive of it as well, because it's not the easiest thing in the world. A lot of travel, a lot of hours, a lot of weird hours. Um, so give her our gratitude as well, because without her, I know that this probably wouldn't be happening for you. Um, so I do appreciate you coming on, guys. Check him out at Lyrical Dota. Uh, you can find me at Toffee's TV if you are inclined to do so. Um, I do want to give a big shout out to everybody who made this possible. Now, the number one people who made this possible is you guys who are watching uh, here on YouTube or on Twitch and, of course, listening on to the podcast. You can find it on Stitcher. You can find it on SoundCloud. You can find it on iTunes, really anywhere that podcasts are hosted at coffee w slash toffees. Uh, if you get tired of watching our mugs on the screen, the podcast is audio only. So it's a great way to hear our soothing voices without having to suffer through our mediocre facial hair. That said, I appreciate you guys hanging out. A thank you to Razor and to Asus Republic of Gamers for the computers and the equipment that we're doing the show on. And of course, a super big shout out to Unicorn uh, for making the show possible and giving me a place where I can sort of play uh, with my play money. And if you guys do want to sort of get in on this uh, play money sort of thing, basically what they do is you have coins and you can invest your coins in raffle items, sort of like when you watch a stream, right? They give you those stupid uh, points for watching for X amount of time that you can sort of play it to win a video card they do the same thing if you want 150 free coins their promo code is lyrical in honor of him being on the show today if you want 250 it's uh toffees uh it's right i'll show you at the end of the show but it's because i'm cooler than lyrical so you get more coins <laughs> with my promo code uh but so check it out if you want to do some play money and uh stuff like that guys thank you for hanging out thank you very much for being here lyrical any final thoughts i love it you're the best keep doing oh. what you're doing Oh, I love when you massage my ego. Well, guys, have a wonderful night, and as always, Toffee's out.